Greetings once again and welcome. It may be a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, depending on where you are on the four corners of the world. It's me again, Professor Kodwo Namo, your course director, wishing you well as you view and listen to this recording. Today we are on module four, course one, which is our last module in this course. Congratulations if you've gone uh, come all the way to this course. And this module four uh, is focusing on financing the climate and carbon markets. So far you have, or you should have gone through the recorded material on module one, course one, that dealt with climate change drivers and historical development of climate and carbon markets. Module two, course one, which looked at the post Kyoto protocol climate and carbon markets. And lastly, module three, course one that focused on policy frameworks and um, uh, climate and carbon market. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on to this course, module four, course one, to this module, module four, course one, financing the climate and carbon market. As usual, uh, the recording or presentation outline is as follows, module learning outcomes and skills gained, We'll talk about module objectives and topics. We'll look at the overview of climate and carbon financing, role of central banks, role of private and commercial banks in carbon financing, role of multilateral and national development banks in carbon financing, bilateral and multilateral UNFCCC funding. You should be familiar with UNFCCC by now, so I'm not worried. Then lastly, the green and or blue bond market. Now, in terms of the learning uh, outcomes, skills, objectives, and topics, at the end of this module, participants will be able to identify current carbon and climate finance uh, participants or stakeholders, mechanisms, and products in the financial system, private and public financing systems. Familiarize yourself with certain global climate funds and their funding cycles and project development protocols. This is critical. Determine the current role of central banks, private and commercial banks in financing climate change, adaptation and low carbon transition or mitigation, climate mitigation. Determine how multilateral and national development banks are financing climate change adaptation and low carbon transition or climate mitigation. Annotate the structure of green and blue bonds markets and their role in financing climate change adaptation resilience and low carbon transition or climate mitigation. Assist on and other African governments in climate and carbon finance readiness. As for the Objectives of the module and the topics, we set two objectives, namely to demonstrate methods being used in financing the climate mitigation and adaptation by finance, financial markets, private sector, multilateral development banks, and other actors. To provide insights into how climate finance is being effective in reducing climate change and how this can be harnessed in and for Africa, we have set about six topics, overview on climate and carbon financing, role of central banks, private and commercial banks financing, role of multilateral and national development banks, bilateral and multilateral UNFCCC funding, and lastly, the green and or blue bonds market. Let's move on to section one on the overview. This is quite interesting, a five minute uh, YouTube clip there you can view what is climate finance. Let me start here and talk about overview. When one considers climate and carbon financing in the context of this course, the bias will be on funding for climate mitigation, especially Article 6. However, fuel climate adaptation funding will also be highlighted. We also emphasize domestic mobilization of climate financing based on the Addis Ababa action agenda of 2015. Quite for you, uh, some of you are observing that I've decided to put a 50 kwacha. A kwacha is a currency of Zambia. And I know for many years, 
we have seen the currency degrading. But I want to thank the government of Zambia, past and especially current, number one, not only for recognizing past presidents on this 50 kwacha note, I think this is of great note. And also, secondly, uh, I've decided to use an African currency. And uh, the third issue about this currency, like it has gained so much. Currently, here in South Africa, uh, we're used to the land being more valuable than the kwacha. But I think the kwacha actually is almost worth one rand. One kwacha is now almost worth one rand 10 cents. And we have seen it growing. And I think uh, there could be something that is being done right there in Zambia. Not to say there's something being done wrong in South Africa, but I know for those that are from Zimbabwe, uh, like some of us, uh, we, 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 we know how the economy was in Zambia and we know how the economy is in Zimbabwe now. So I think our regional leaders, I think they have got some few things to learn from the Zamb current Zambian situation. And uh, it's important if you're a government official who is listening to my talk to note that I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to be politically correct. I'm just trying to state some facts of life. Financial resources and sound investments are needed to address climate change to both reduce emissions, promote adaptation to impacts that are already occurring and to build resilience. Financial resources are also now needed to address loss and damage resulting from slow onsets and extreme events. By slow onsets, we are talking about sea level rise, desertification, ecosystems loss, ocean acidification. These are all slow onsets. Extreme events, we're talking about tornadoes or cyclones, depending on where we are. Or we are tornadoes or twisters, depending on where you are, cyclones or hurricanes, depending on where you are. Uh, we also speak about extreme flooding, extreme frost, extreme heat. All these are extreme events that we are saying fall under loss and damage. Then we also speak about migration and displacement. So I think when you talk about the broader climate financing, those are some of the areas that are not mitigation related, but adaptation and resilience building related that also need financing. So at times we discover that there's a serious bias towards financing mitigation action because there's always a business case to finance mitigation. The business will always find a, a, a space to invest in solar energy or wind energy, the geothermal, because they will make money but they will not find a reason to invest in building resilient roads because then that becomes a social imperative and a government agenda. So I to say, when I talk about this climate financing, climate and carbon financing, and to say we should not only then focus exclusively on carbon financing, which is mitigation, but we should also highlight financing uh, for non-mitigation issues. So we will pursue the following major types of climate finance and how finance institutions are interacting with them. Mitigation finance, adaptation finance, including building resilience and loss and damage. Climate finance is established by Article 9 of the Paris Agreement, which stipulates that developed countries shall provide, I like that one, shall provide financial resources to assist developing countries with respect to both climate change mitigation and adaptation, I like the both. According to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, climate finance refers to local, national, or transitional financing, which may be drawn from public, private, and alternative sources of finance. Climate finance aims at reducing emissions and enhancing greenhouse gas sinks, and aims at reducing vulnerability and maintaining and increasing the resilience of human and ecological systems to negative climate change impacts. I've already spoken about these impacts. I think we tied on them earlier on when we're talking about drivers in module one. Now, what is quite interesting here from uh, this author's uh, 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 boundary at all is like they just talk about policy typologies. So when they talk about, say, what is the policy instrument, policy definition, then country of experience, what is quite interesting, we've got things that go targeted lending. I'm, I'm now going, column one going down, green bond or blue bonds, 
loan guarantees, weather index insurance, checks credits, feed-in tariffs, national development banks, national climate funds, each around disclosure. I won't be able to go through the whole um, table with you, but I just want to touch a bit around targeted lending, which requires banks to lend a certain portion of their credit or deposit towards certain policy priorities such as agriculture and clean energy. And we've seen India and China doing that. Bonds market, um, bonds uh, are earmarked uh, for projects with environmental or and or climate benefits, China, Indonesia, India, the US, we've seen them doing that. Tax credit as well, we've spoken about that. Feed-in tariffs, you look at uh, Spain, Germany, China, uh, using that. So I think as a participant, you always have time to go into this table and familiarize with it yourself. The other interesting part there on, on, on the policy uh, by function there is that climate finance policies can be broadly grouped into demand side policies, supply side policies, and policies that link the two sides. So you see, all these things are critical. Maybe you might even get a quiz asking you to say, what are demand side policies? What are supply side policies? Because it's always interesting to, to get this. So say demand side policies are those that create or increase effective demand for climate finance by translating a need for a green investment into well prepared bankable project. A bankable project means then that should, it should generate adequate returns for you to, to invest in that. So under the regulations and guidelines, we've got renewable portfolios, um, command and control, environment and social standards, ETC, also with market-based incentives. We spoke about capital trade, uh, carbon taxes, we spoke about that. Financial measures, private lending, green credit, green bonds, it's uh, blue bonds there other voluntary programs such as the equator principles, micro, macro level policy. We also have de-risking, loan uh, guarantees, insurance arrangements. Then we've got also domestic and international public finance, things like the National Climate Fund, Green Climate Fund, Bilateral Climate Change Aid, Clean Development Mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, we've spoken about that. Information and capacity, uh, green stock uh, index, certification schemes, rating systems, all these are interesting instruments and policy terms. Beyond that, uh, demand side policies can also include tax incentives, feed in tariffs, carbon prices, which internalize negative externalities. Supply side policies, on the other end, are those that increase the supply of affordable finance for green projects or sectors by creating incentives or penalties. And incentives policies are targeted lending, green bonds, green insurance, and others, like what we're talking about in the diagram. Now, what is also interesting when we're talking about the uh, principles of climate finance is this idea of polluter pays. You know, the polluter pays principle was first set in the Rio uh, Declaration. It's one of the principles that the polluter must pay. So in this case, simply saying the polluter pays principle is the commonly accepted practice according to which those who produce pollution should bear the cost by managing it to prevent damage to human environment and also the environment. We also have got the common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities that is coming from the UNFCCC, I think it's Article 3 or 2 if I'm not mistaken, and additionality. So additionality is when climate finance should be additional to existing commitments to avoid the diversion of funding for development needs for climate change action. So you, you, you must be found already with a project that, that you are working on. So then uh, that fund becomes additional on top of what, because this idea of diversions and also vote, uh, vote diversions is there usually in government. So when there's something that comes and you can just easily divert. So I think when then there's no project and the funds come, they can easily be diverted. Adequacy and precaution, it is basically the level of funding it needs to be sufficient to keep a global temperature within limits as, a pro as possible and pre the predictability. Climate finance must be predictable to ensure sustainable flow of climate finance. So I think the issue of predictability, predictability has cost us a lot. Uh, I know in uh, um, during COP, uh, COP15, if I'm not mistaken, in Copenhagen, uh, there was this um, uh, pledge by developed nations to say uh, uh, when the developing nations said, show us the money. And they say, okay, we are going to show you the money. It's 100 billion 
uh, per year that is going to come. Uh, and they even had a, a fast start climate finance of about 10 billion US. And up to now, we are still talking about the 100 billion that has never come. So these are issues around predict pred predictability that cause a lot of commotion, especially when there is a promise or a note on the table uh, of 100 billion and that, that never comes. Now we are in 2022, almost going to 2023, and that money is nowhere to be found. Now, also is there around when looking at the global landscape of climate finance, I think um, uh, what is quite interesting there is uh, uh, the, the, the thickness of the lines correlates or corresponds to the amount of money flowing. Uh, then CPI uh, presents annual averages to smooth out fluctuations in the data. So the numbers here denote an annual average over 2019 and 2020. And of course, all figures are in US dollars. So you can see the, the national, uh, the bilateral, the multilateral, uh, the multilateral uh, funds as well, state-owned flows, commercial flows, uh, other funds, households, individuals, corporations. So you can see the corporations, how much money is coming from there. And also the colors, they are talking about public money, private money, uh, then the dark, darker blue, public financial uh, 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 intermediaries. Then, of course, uh, the other, uh, uh, almost like the brick red, I talk about private financial intermediaries. So all these things, they are important. You can see how the money is flowing. This actually is done by Climate Policy Initiative. Now, there are things there that are interesting to say. What are some of the issues that arise from the climate finance? Number one, we, we raised seven issues there. Lack of credit. There has been a continuing lack of clarity on how this climate finance should be defined and accounted for. Serious concerns raised over self-reporting by developed country parties. So, you know, they were, it's almost like beating your, your chest and there's very little that is coming from there. Then also defining uh, uh, definition of climate finance varies in reports. So the definitions of climate change finance used in various reports are not consistent with those of the UNFCCC provisions. Then of course, there's bias towards mitigation. I spoke about this. And I think climate financing too recently had a clear bias towards mitigation. In 2013 and 2014, 70% of climate change aid from climate funds and 82% of MDBs funded were directed to mitigation. I'm sure this is now changing, especially in the Green Climate Fund and the direction it is taking. A threat to contributions by major polluters like the US, inadequate uh, corpus of funds, then uncertain end use, and also fiscal deficit related. All these you can check. So these are some of the issues that come concerning the climate finance. And there's a participant you need to familiarize with. Now, what is quite interesting there, uh, since we talk about climate finance and the multilateral development banks, it was going to be criminal for me not to touch base with the African Development Bank and what it is doing now and possibly what it's going to do in the future. So I'm just looking there at Africa's estimated climate financing needs and this source from Africa Development Bank, it says between about 1.3 trillion and 1.6 trillion averaging 1.4 trillion will be needed over 20 to 2030 to implement Africa's climate uh, action commitments and nationally determined contributions. You are now familiar with NDCs. I won't get into that again. So still climate finance committed and mobilized for Africa falls far short of the continent's needs and historical carbon emission shares, creating an estimated annual financing gap of 99.9 to 127.2 billion in 2020 and 2030. The global finance, the climate finance landscape is highly fragmented and mirrors political economy of the donor dominated architecture. I think this is one of the key issues that we are going to be saying. If we're going to talk about financing, climate financing and financing the carbon market, the domestic mobilization of resources really is going to remain critical. And you know, the donor dominated architecture means the donors uh, pulls the strings 
if they don't want maybe the money to go to Zimbabwe or go to Rwanda or go to Zambia or go to Mali, Togo, then it, it, it won't go there. So I say there, as we talk climate finance, we want to say, yes, we are going to push for global finance to, 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 to also start flowing significantly. We will not forget to start mobilizing our resources. Budget taking, it's important in terms of our movement for climate financing. Several innovative climate finance instruments can be used to support climate resilience and adjust energy transition in Africa, especially and domestically, green banks and national climate funds, as well as blended finance, could be used to de-risk private sector green finance investments. Now we can also talk about leveraging innovative and new financing instruments, uh, which will require actions from all key stakeholders in the fin in the finance system. So what is coming there? from the Africa Development Bank uh, 2022 report, they're talking about uh, adaptation we, uh, we, with the amount that we require there, about 259 to 407 billion, mitigation, 715 billion, technical and technological needs, 1.38 billion, loss and damage needs, I like this one, uh, 2.89.2 to 440 billion, monitoring, reporting, and verification. Those are some of the amounts. So the, when you talk about at a broader continental level, these are some of the financial needs that we're going to, 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 to require if we're going to uh, address climate uh, change impacts effectively. And I think these are good baseline figures that then when we are speaking uh, as a continent, we at least have some figures that are there on the ground. Now, these are some of the, uh, 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 when you're comparing now the uh, finances that are there, uh, you discover for uh, lower limit, upper limit, you know, East Africa total, what, what is required there in billions, and all that is coming through is then there is definitely a need for uh, climate financing, uh, which needs to be mobilized both domestically and internationally. Now, the energy sector received up to 26% of Africa's total climate finance inflows in 2010 to 2019. And this trend is likely to continue given the quest for net zero emissions by 2050 and also the great interest from the private sector and other partners. So when you're looking there, the sectors, it's the energy sector that receive, receive a, a lot of funding, also water supply and sanitation uh, coming in also as well there, uh, receiving significant amounts. Now, what is also interesting there, when you look at the share uh, in terms of countries now, this is actually looking at Africa, African countries. This is why I like the Africa Development Bank publication, because it's focusing on the African countries. You discover Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa account for about a third of Africa's climate financing gap in the energy sector. So those are actually the, 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 the huge uh, takers of, of, of the climate finance. And I'm saying as we move forward then, the other countries are also going to be coming into the picture and uh, the mobilization of uh, climate finance, carbon finance, is going to be huge. The other one also is the partial conditionalities. Uh, this is coming from the NDCs. We are talking about 37 NDCs from Africa. So we to, when we talk about adaptation conditionalities in those and mitigation conditionalities in those uh, um, NDCs, this is what is uh, spoken about there to say, uh, uh, in terms of adaptation, the, the, some of this spoke about fully, we, we are not going to engage in these adaptation conditions without money. So they say fully conditional. So I think the action in that particular uh, sector uh, is going to be fully conditional, partially conditional and not mentioned. So when you look at these um, NDCs, most of them, they are saying it's full conditional, it's conditional, fully conditional, that we can't impact on these mitigation measures if there's no financing. Then some uh, the majority, of course, I say partially conditional, meaning uh, the if if uh, uh, of course in the in the partial conditionality, the bulk of the money is money coming from outside or other entities, and the the lesser is the domestic mobilizing. So what is interesting then is there are conditions upon which these nationally determined contributions are going to be implemented, and these are financial conditions and possibly technical conditions as well that if not met, it won't happen. Now, what are the roles, uh, we are moving to section two now, what are the roles of central banks in, in, in climate and carbon financing? You can look at it, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, slides that I've put in there, you can you can view them and they'll give you some, some, some insights. 
So central banks are mainly concerned with financial stability and protecting the financial systems from not being affected by climate-related risks. So central banks as regulators and supervisors of participants in the financial system ensure that the financial products, including climate finance, uh, finance forecasts, are created to, to solve for climate change impact so as to interrupt uh, to interrupt so as to not interrupt financial and economic stability so this is basically <clears throat> where the central banks will come in making sure that everything is being done and there's not going to be too much interruption in the financial system and the Basel committee on banking supervision concludes that traditional risk categories used by financial institutions and reflected in the Basel framework can be used to capture climate-related financial risk. However, additional work is needed to connect climate risk drivers to banks' exposures and to reliably estimate such risks. Now, these are some of the roles of the central banks when I'm talking about climate financing. I won't be dwelling much on the central banks because a lot of work is coming and I think we are going to be learning as we go as well. Private and commercial banks, we have seen them actively involved. So commercial banks on businesses practice fulfill three key roles that if uh, affect climate change mitigation, namely as risk assessors and risk managers, as lenders and financiers, and lastly, the, as profiteers and the middlemen in lucrative global carbon markets and renewable low carbon technology investments. So you see that that's the first one. Second, banks are in a unique position to influence other corporate sector uh, actors, business practices, and greenhouse gas emissions through their roles as creditors, investors, advisors, and heads of supply chain. Therefore, climate change, finance, and carbon markets have provided opportunities for innovation for the banks. So remember, the banks have also got the power. So they can decide, we want to invest in this vehicle. We will go on to invest in this vehicle. So there is a central role that these commercial uh, uh, banks are play in the climate and, 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 and carbon markets. So remember, I was talking about companies, if they see an opportunity, if they don't have funding, they go to the banks, present their, their business case, then they get financing. So the banks are going to be here uh, forever, if so to speak, and they will be central in terms of climate financing. So there is a summary of some of the issues that, that are emerging there. We are saying the commercial bank lending with climate consideration, what happens is conventional commercial bank lending with climate considerations growing, driven by both commercial banks, voluntary climate strategies, and also financial regulations. We spoke about green bonds and also uh, uh, blue bonds, uh, green bonds and green loans that are coming, sustainability linked bonds and sustainability linked loans, sustainability banks and social bonds, green asset banked securities, and other uh, instruments that are coming. You can actually get into the table and read it on your own at time. What is interesting now is to see what has been happening. Remember, we're talking about a, a, there's a controversy that is there. So you discover once, once there's a lot of talk around, we need to 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 find to climate green climate finance. We need also to finance the carbon market. What is happening is like this: there still remains some controversy in terms of continued financing of fossil fuels by banks and other entities. And the ongoing Ukraine-Russia war has even made it worse. So you discover there that you no, know, um, this was uh, by market it and it 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 tracked for for uh, for 2020 from 2016 to 2020. So it said there are some of the banks that have decreased fossil fuel financing and banks that have increased fossil fuel financing. So you discover there there's quite a lot of you know, uh, postal service bank of China, China uh, Mansion Bank, Standard Chartered. All these banks, they have actually increased you no know, standard chartered because there is also a serious stake from Chinese interest. Then you see it, 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 it it's financing of fossil fuels has increased. You realize when you go to the other side, USB, you're talking about a, 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 a credit mutual, all those have actually reduced significantly, almost going to 100% for, for, for credit, credit mutual, no longer financing there. And yeah, on the other hand, Postal Savings Bank of China going to 1,200% increase in financing fossil fuel. So all these things are interesting. If you speak about the role of banks, there's that controversy that why some, some banks are now putting off the, uh, 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 pulling the foot from the 
pedal in terms of financing fossil fuels, others actually are accelerating financing uh, fossil fuels. And then that's uh, a challenge in terms of where we want to be in the climate and carbon markets or uh, uh, climate and carbon financing. Now, the multilateral development banks also and national development banks also play a very important role, this is section four. And let us maybe well into here and see what is going to happen with that. You can you can look at um, some of those uh, 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 YouTube clips and, and see what is happening there. Now, there are five key roles which multilateral development banks, uh, they should be abbreviated as MDBs, uh, do to support the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. So you see that bank, uh, those um, MDBs, they are financing infrastructure investment, they are mobilizing external finance, either private or public for infrastructure investment. They are also being intermediaries that blend international climate and public development finance with their own resources, because they also have their own resources. And this is done in order to help mobilize and, and scale up private investment in infrastructure. They also uh, policy influencers that can help shape broad and specific policy frameworks to encourage and channel private investment into infrastructure. And lastly, they, they, they are pipeline developers that identify and develop bankable projects and or investment in demonstration uh, projects and the new technologies that uh, prove commercial viability. You see some of the funds that come from the MDBs that, that will come there. So this figure, what is done from the uh, World Resources Institute they were they were looking at um uh, some of the uh, uh, mdb climate finance 2016 to 2020 compared to 2020 targets so what is interesting there's also african development bank so the african development bank is the one that is written afdb uh, which is in almost like second column there it actually uh, uh, failed to meet its target for 40% by 2020 so they were saying them in terms of the climate finance by 2020 uh, 40 percent the target a target of 40 percent but there are also other banks that met their world bank group uh the, the, the target there uh, they, they've actually met their 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 target and even went over now let's maybe try to now present a, a, a brief case study of the africa development bank and what it is doing so here is a brief of the Africa Development Bank, which has several climate and carbon market funds and facilities that governments and entities can, can follow up. And these include, we have got one, which is Africa Climate Change Fund, Canada Africa Development Bank Climate Fund, Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program, Adaptation Benefit Mechanism, African Carbon Support Program, Climate Investment Fund. This actually is actually a fund coming through the World Bank. Congo Basin Forest Fund also coming through the World Bank. It also administers part of the global environment facility. I think there is an, it could be Jeff 8 that is coming, or I may not be sure whether it's Jeff 8 or White Circle, but I think there is lots, there is significant, no, let me say, let me not say lots of money. There is significant money now in, in the Jeff Global Environment Facility that once we pitch our project properly, then we should be able to access it. Now, the scale of climate finance in the Africa Development Bank approves shows an increasing trend, which is good. So when you're talking about the adaptation mitigation, what is happening? There is a growing trend in terms of financing. The money might not be, uh, uh, it could not, be, it might not be big monies, but there is a significant increase in terms of 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 share uh, of of climate uh, climate funds. Then also, what is interesting there uh, when into so so they were talking about basically that the project and everything. Yeah. You are not talking about the actual money. So you see, the topmost there is four billion. So once really we are talking about about the share increasing, climate finance adaptation, all that kind of stuff. But the money we are talking about is not that much. Four billion is not a lot for the entire continent. So you see there what is happening in terms of the share over the years up to 2021. Actually, the money is we are talking about slightly above uh, 2.5 billion for 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 climate finance, uh, uh, which is the which is uh, like the total. And whereas you are saying that it's it's not going to do a lot. Uh, so what we need to do now is to upscale. Uh, we also need even the bank to be involved in 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 scaling up in actually increasing the volumes and and how we're going to do it is also going to be one of the major challenges we'll face as, as, as the continent. Now, 
What is happening there? Uh, I'm also going to focus on the World Bank's Climate Investment Fund, which is one of the biggest funds that we have. So this, um, in terms of a summary, I say the Climate Investment Fund is comprised of two multi-donor trust funds. So we've got the Clean Technology Fund and also we've got the Strategic Climate Fund. And of course, the uh, Climate uh, uh, Technology Fund provides emerging economies with scaled up financing for demonstration deployment and transfer of low carbon technologies with a significant uh, uh, potential on long-term greenhouse gas emission savings. And of course, there's also the climate uh, um, investment fund and what is happening there. So what is interesting for me, I won't be looking a lot in the summary and activities proposed, but I want, I'm going to be looking for this, some of these funds. I will be looking at the forecast so that at least when you are applying for these funds, you know what it is uh, the focus because there's no use for you to apply for the fund and the focus is not what you're trying to apply for so the climate investment fund its focus is mitigation adaptation and also cross-cutting activities now in terms of the funding instruments also it's important for the for the climate investment fund it talks about grants uh, contingent grants concessional loans market rate loans equity and guarantees. So this is actually the interesting part that comes. Then there's also co-financing requirements. What is needed, you can read on your own. But to assessing the fund, it means there are funding windows. Now, this is critical. When you want to assess this fund, you can't then just rock there without knowing that there are funding windows. So there's funding windows, scaling up renewable energy in low-income countries program, clean technology fund, forest investment fund a program, pilot programs for climate resilience. So these actually are how to access, what you can access the fund. And of course, there is the website for you. Now, there are also other funds that are bilateral and multilateral, which is section five uh, on, and uh, surrounding the UNFCCC funding. And I'm going to go through some of them here. Uh, you have got the Green Climate uh, Fund, GCF. We have got also the... Uh, mm -hmm. The, uh, is, is one of the funds that I'm going to consider. We will also maybe come to GEF uh, as one of the funds and others if I've got time. But let me try to start by say uh, talk about bilateral and multilateral, multilateral UNFTB funding. Bilateral climate finance is from various budget lines of bilateral donors, mainly from developed countries, including, for instance, the UK, Germany, and Japan, US also at times. Now, these are usually based on a country-to-country -country agreement. So bilateral, we can't say we are going to utilize bilateral funding as an, as, a, as an African continent. It might not work that way because it could be an agreement between Japan and, and Rwanda. It could be an agreement between Germany and Rwanda. It could be an agreement between the United Kingdom and Rwanda. And it could be an agreement between USA and Rwanda. So there, there won't be any stake there for maybe less than two or Swaziland, or it could be Burundi, or Tanzania, or any other country, it could be Egypt, um, a, a, and, and, and maybe Sao Tome and Prince. Or, or they, they, they might be, so the bilateral means it's bilateral. So multilateral funds are international institutions funded by several developing countries to distribute climate grants and loans. And also this can, can, can happen. And other forms of climate finance, including bilateral country-to-country -country funds, multilateral development banks, we have spoken about that earlier on. Um, never mind about the small uh, fund here, but it's actually readable. You could also, as a participant, just try to see what is happening there. So the main column says, what is the implementing agents and institution? Then it, we start by multilateral uh, funds there and initiatives. So we have got things like the Adaptation Fund, Africa Climate Change Fund, I spoke about that one, Africa Renewable Energy Initiative, Central African Forest Initiative, Congo Basin Forest Fund, all these, they are uh, multilateral funds and initiatives. But also there's a, there are a bit of bilateral there that are there towards the end. And it also shows uh, if it's a bilateral, what is happening, multilateral, what is happening, what is the implementing agents, the Africa Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, all that kind of stuff, it's in there. So you could, at your spare time, uh, sit down and see, and for your interest, which funds are there. They are also going to help you as your country when you want to. Now, it also it works as, a, as, as an inventory for funding. So that by the time you want to apply for climate financing, carbon financing, then you know uh, which multilateral or bilateral funds you might want to look at.
Now, what is interesting here is for us to focus, for example, one of the big uh, funds that we have is the Green Climate Fund. Remember, we spoke about it being established uh, during COP15 in Copenhagen, and now I think it was uh, 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 solidified in Cancun in 2016 during COP, uh, COP16. And now um, what is uh, uh, interesting there is for you to note the steps in terms of accreditation process. So you cannot just uh, get to the... To the, to the Green Climate Fund, which I'm saying is one of the biggest funds, without you having been accredited as a as a, as, a, as a, one of the entities as a country. So the first thing then is for you to get accredited, for you to access the Green Climate Fund. And what does it entail? You have to complete a Green Climate Fund self-assessment too. This is not obligatory. Then you have to obtain nomination letter from the a uh, national designated entity uh, authority, which is uh, uh, only for direct access. Then we also have got to request access to the online accreditation system, complete online accreditation system application, pay applicable accreditation fee, institutional assessment and completion. When application is complete, it is forwarded to the accreditation, uh, accreditation panel accreditation panel reviews application and sent inquiries to applicant. When application is complete, then it goes to the next one, board decision to accredit or not to accredit applicant. If approved, you continue to legal arrangements, signing accreditation master agreement. So this can take time. So it's also important now to say, if you want to access the GCF, the first port of call is to say, do we have an accredited entity in 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 your in your in your country? For South Africa, it's I think South African National Biodiversity Institute. So you could actually uh, go through that. So other issues that are interesting, I know there are other participants that are not from government that might think they can access these bilateral uh, bilateral funds. Most of these bilateral funds are access are accessed through that national accredited accredited entity. And then it means they are going through a government. And they're not talking about small uh, grants or whatever. Uh, they're talking about big funds. So it means the projects need to be huge projects and they're also administered at that particular level, at a national level. So some of the issues there in terms of the Green Climate Fund, there's a summary focus, mitigation, adaptation, cross-cutting as well, activities there, financing instruments, grants, concessional loans, equity, guarantees. Then co-financing is required as well. Now, there are also some other issues that are interesting. Eligibility criteria. Now, that, that's crit critical. Eligibility criteria, when I talk about that, it says here, yeah, all developing country parties to the UNFCCC are eligible to receive resources from the G Green Climate Fund. The fund finances the agreed full and agreed incremental cost of activities to enable and support enhanced action on adaptation mitigation, including Red Plus. Red Plus is reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. Technology development and transfer, including carbon capture and storage, capacity building, and the preparation of national reports by developing countries. So it even gives you eligibility and what project, accessing the fund, funding windows, mitigation and adaptation projects, private sector facility, Red Plus results based payment programs, project preparation facility and readiness program, the finance modalities, all those things are there. And you can get further details on the website that we have given there. So I think I want to encourage you participants, if your government is going to want to apply for the Green Climate Fund, these are some of the building blocks that you are now aware of. Let me move also to the Global Environment Facility. The Global Environment Facility is also, uh, it aims uh, to helping developing countries and economies in transition contribute to overall objective of the UNFCCC to mitigate climate change while enabling sustainable economic development. The GEF is intended to cover the incremental cost of measures to address environmental issues such as climate change related to a business as usual baseline. Focus again, mitigation, adaptation, and cross-cutting. This is quite important because we discover when we talk about adaptation fund, it doesn't finance mitigation. So this is why it's always important. Activity supported, agriculture, ecosystems adaptation, education, energy efficiency, forestry and land use, industry and infrastructure, renewable energy, rural transportation, urban waste management, 
oceans and coastal resources, disaster risk reduction, health, gender, jobs, and livelihoods, poverty. It is, so you discover that Jeff, remember it's a global environment facility. So that's why it is broader. And then because climate change, disaster risk, there are also, also energy efficiency, renewable energy, which are mainly on the, in the carbon market space come in here. Financing instruments, grants, concessional loans, equity grants. Then co-financing, that is required. If you need more, you can go to the uh, side. And the other fund that uh, is interesting there uh, is uh, a, what uh, uh, what was I talking then? No, this is still the F. The other fund that is interesting there is the adaptation fund. So the adaptation fund really, it's an interesting uh, fund, and uh, the adaptation fund was established to finance concrete adaptation projects and programs. And what is interesting is that the adaptation fund used to get two percent from a clean development project. It was being channeled towards adaptation fund. And the clean development mechanism, remember, it was part of the uh, Kyoto Protocol. So that was part of the money, but they don't have lots of money. I think they could have not more than even 12 billion or so in the kitty. Focus, strictly adaptation and activity supported, water source management, land management, agriculture. You can see all these are systems that are in the, in the adaptation space. And the interesting part, it's grants. So these are not loans or whatever, it's grants. So for, for, for a country or an entity that now uh, is going to approach the adaptation fund, you know, when you get it, it's going to be grants. Co-financing, also they talk about that, eligibility criteria, eligible countries are developing country parties to the Kyoto Protocol that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. So that's supposed, it was supposed to be to the UNFCCC, not Kyoto Protocol, that's an error there. So you can look at that because uh, 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 the Kyoto Protocol parties were developed developed countries. So it can be developing countries parties to the Kyoto Protocol. So I was correcting this to say, it's super supposed to be developing country parties to the UNFCCC, United Nations uh, 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 Framework Convention on Climate Change. And of course, modalities there, they are enhanced direct access, large grants, micro grants. Also, then it will be now your duty to go to the adaptation fund website to see when they say micro grant, how small it is, when they say large grant, how big it is. Now, this just may be a summary of some of the bilateral funding that you might want to look at that are of interest. This I, I picked from the Africa Development uh, Bank, and it talks about the global finance, uh, global climate uh, partnership fund. Then uh, uh, those are the countries that are there, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, Tanzania, Uganda, International Climate Initiative, those are the countries, um, MDG's Achievement Fund, those are the countries, all these uh, red and early movers fund, those are the countries who is supporting the Germany, United Kingdom. So there are now things that are also of interest here. So is there going to be uh, uh, trying to seek funding uh, for uh, climate and carbon markets and even adaptation? and it's bilateral, the first thing is to go to that column and say, is my country there? If yes, then you can access it. If your country is not there, it's not there. So you can't waste even time trying to force matters. So I can see there, 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 the countries that are mentioned, I think the one that is with lots of countries included is the Norway International Climate Forest Initiative and also the RED, which is also related to climate early movers. And now, by default, when I now start talking about the a forest, you are now in the carbon markets. You are talking about carbon sinks through or carbon sequestration through uh, conserving forests. What is only important for us as Africans then is to see to it that when, in as much as we engage with these bilateral funds, are we not then mortgaging our forest to a level where we cannot use them? So you will also need to have, to have a critical eye when we are trying to access some of these funds. It's not just the, to the fact that the fund is there, then it should be used when you're using that fund, at what cost? So these are some of the issues that are saying we need to be careful as governments when before we even engage uh, to say there is money, then you just want to rush there and take the money and mortgage your forest, you can't use it. So I'm saying where we are going in terms of net zero by 2050, we don't want to reach a situation whereby by 2050, we have nothing to talk about because all the forests in the Congo Basin have been mortgaged or they are already under contract. And yet we are supposed to be reducing our carbons, uh, carbon emission as a country. 
So I say in the whilst we are talking a lot about this carbon and climate market, we also need to be very, very, very careful in terms of, of the fact that we should not mortgage some of our assets as Africans. It's going to be dangerous because come 2050, and 2050 is coming. I'm talking about 2050 because that's the year where I say we need to be carbon neutral. Then when everybody else in the world is taking those forests, uh, financed you to to for for financed them for their own carbon uh, credits or projects. Then you are saying what is going to happen with us then as Africans when 2020 50 2050 comes and we need to reduce our emissions. So there's going to be a lot of wisdom required in terms of how, to what extent do we engage with this carbon market. Now I'm going to move to the last section of this uh, uh, module and recording, which is the green and blue bond market. You can go there on the YouTube uh, with uh, some few clips there for you. What is a green bond? How the one trillion green bond market works? Did you know green bonds in two minutes? John Speck, the city of John Speck list a green bond. Uh, that's quite an interesting one. You can also look at the blue bonds. Uh, all you need to know about blue bonds, uh, three minutes a clip. Why investing in blue bonds? Uh, could lead to green ocean, two minutes, blue blue economy, Seychelles sovereign blue bond. I think the Seychelles one is interesting. Well, I think this was the pioneer uh, blue bond uh, in the world. But now, when I was talking about the, the green and the blue bond, I could not stop reasoning, but you know, they are part of what we call sustainable financing. So in my mind, then I conceptualized what I thought is the relationship between blue bonds, green bonds, and sustainable financing. So what this is saying is both the green and the blue bonds are part of sustainable financing. So that's why the bigger circle is sustainable financing. Then within that, we also have a, what is a green bond, which is part, a subset of sustainable financing. And the blue bond, which is a subset of a green bond. Now, this is quite tricky. Because right now there's a this idea to want to to consider blue bond as separate from green bond. It's fine, but the major reason that is like blue bond is a specialized green bond, or you can say it's a specialized sustainable financing bond. So really, it it will be good to understand this relationship so that you don't get lost when people start talking about blue bonds, green bonds, sustainable financing. Now there are three basic types of green bonds. So there's direct financing of climate projects, including project bonds and municipal revenue bonds. Then there's also direct refinancing of climate projects, including project bonds and assist as asset-backed securities. Refinancing is replacement of existing with new financing. Then there's also indirect finance or refinancing climate projects through claims on green news of finance from bonds that are uh, uh, backed by the overall balance sheet of the issuer. Now, there's, quite, there's been quite a lot of uh, a, 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 a movement there. And what is what is, what is is coming from this slide that I took from Africa Development Bank is that green, uh, green financing is heavily concentrated in developed countries and Africa lags behind. So when the reason why uh, I'm putting this you would discover that green bonds are part of green financing or sustainable financing or whatever. But then what we are looking at here is when you look at Africa, there is almost when you look at a, 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 a green bonds 2018, there was almost, you know, the graph is almost like not there. Uh, 27, the same. We, we just have like, you just see that they could be even like a triplet. 2019 the same, 2020 the same, 2021 just a bit. So what is happening there? Uh, the main message from this gra graph is like, when you consider green bonds, green loans, sustainable bonds, sustainability linked bonds and loans, Africa is still lagging behind. We can add now the blue bonds as a separate entity. We are lagging behind badly, uh, lagging, lagging behind badly. So really by the end of the day, all this is it's something that, that should worry us to say there are some areas that we are lagging behind and we need to, uh, to, to raise that. We also look at um, uh, 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 that uh, the, this, uh, when we move now, uh, there's some kind of, in, now looking at the countries uh, and, and, and the, the, the nature of the funds that are coming there, 
uh, green bonds, green bonds, uh, loans, sustainable bonds, sustainable link bonds, and loans, and all those other countries. And we discover, for example, for South Africa, they inspired quite a lot on sustainability linked bonds that uh, that 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 have come come up, and also on green bonds for South Africa. Then Mauritius is another country that has done well in terms of the green bonds and also a, a sustainability linked uh, funds. Then on green loans, we have got also South Africa dominating. So basically now what is coming through is that South Africa, Mauritius, they are dominating that, that, that space. There are also Egypt is coming there and Togo in terms of sustainability linked uh, bonds and 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 other financing mechanisms so this graph is is very good in terms of you can even check where your country is if it is there on the on on the map if it's not on the map also it also tells you where you are as well now one of the uh, green bonds celebrated heavily was the city of Johannesburg green bond of 2018 also in august 2018 the city of Johannesburg here in south africa launched the first green bond on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Uh, and uh, the, the 101.46 uh, billion bond was priced at 185 basis points, which is 1.85% above the uh, other 2023 government bond. And this is due to mature in 2024. So money raised. Uh, now, this is quite important. So we cannot just as a, as a, as an entity, whether a municipality from a municipality or a government, just rock and say I want to have a green bond. You should have the purpose for that green bond. So the purpose for this was that money raised was to finance green initiatives like the biogas to energy project, solar geyser initiative, as well as all other projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and contribute to the resilient of the, the resilience of the city. So that's why that green bond was launched. Seychelles also, it pioneered the blue bond. And in October 2018, same year, Seychelles launched the world's first sovereign blue bond. I like this one. So the world's first sovereign blue bond was, did not come from a developed nation. It came here from Africa, from Seychelles. And that blue bond was designed to support sustainable marine and fisheries projects. And if you are going to also talk about the sustainable development goals, it then links us back to SDG 14, where we are talking about ocean and blue economy. So the, now you see why Seychelles went for the blue bond. Remember, Seychelles is surrounded by water, many other small island states. So they would rather, they are more comfortable talking about the blue bonds than the green bonds. So then this is why I'm saying now, the, at times it becomes a matter of semantics, but we know a lot of uh, uh, small island states they prefer talking about the blue economy. They, 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 they also prefer talking about the blue bonds. So Seychelles, kudos to you. you. You were the first country to to to, to bring uh, the, the blue bond, uh, sovereign blue bond globally. So the blue bond raised about 15 million uh, from international investors. It may not be a lot of money for, for bigger economies, but for economies like Seychelles, this is actually a significant amount that was raised. And what was it to be used for? These proceeds, from the blue bond were aimed at supporting the expansion of marine protected areas, improved governance of private fisheries, and also development of Seychelles' blue economy. Which, so you see, when also increasing marine um, protected areas, we are now also playing into the carbon uh, sequestration and carbon system. So those blue bonds can be used to finance a project which can even be registered as a as a, as a carbon market project. So these are some of the links now that we see from even an adaptation project and how it can link to, to, to the mitigation project, especially nature-based uh, uh, solutions project or ecosystems-based solutions projects. They actually address both mitigation and adaptation. So grants and loans were due to be provided through the Blue Grants Fund, which was established, and also the Blue Investment Fund. And both funds, are managed by the Seychelles Conserv Conservation and Climate Adaptation Trust and the Development Bank of Seychelles. Remember now, we spoke about development banks. We are seeing a development bank being uh, uh, coming into the picture. Yes, as usual, uh, this was quite an interesting uh, uh, module. There will be your quizzes at the end uh, that you can attempt. And I'm hoping that in the recording we've covered um, um, uh, the, the significance or important critical elements uh, of the uh, 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 financing uh, financing in the climate and carbon uh, financing the climate uh, 
uh, uh, uh, I'm going to take this one. We're talking about um, uh, uh, financing uh, climate and carbon markets. So really, we are saying there, there are major issues that we spoke about in this space. So we, we, we started by talking about uh, when I talk about financing, there's the role of banks, there's the role of multilateral development banks, there's international development banks, there's the role of bilateral uh, 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 funding, and we tied on some of the key uh, 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 multilateral funds, which is the Green Climate Fund. We also spoke about the Adaptation Fund. We also spoke about Global Environmental Fund. And of course, there's also another fund maybe that we might talk about is I think the Commonwealth uh, facility, which is also a climate fund, we can talk about it. But we also went on to talk uh, about the uh, role of um, central banks in climate and carbon financing, which is mainly regulatory, regulating these commercial banks, and as also as they de-risk uh, the economies. And we ended by looking at very interesting uh, uh, systems there that's talking about, uh, of course, overall sustainable financing, but we're looking at uh, green bonds, and also spoke about blue bonds. And you said in um, uh, in Africa, possibly seat of one spec was one of the first ones in terms of uh, listing a blue a, a green bond on the uh, uh, joint spec stock exchange, and the rest quite a lot of money there. And in Seychelles, the first sovereign bond, a blue bond in the world, raised about 15 million US dollars. And of course, it's being administered by other entities and the uh, Social uh, Development Bank. So these are some of the interesting perspectives that we spoke about. And we said uh, uh, the funding that is coming through to Africa, generally the bilateral, especially the bilateral, you, you have to be, you have to check uh, is your country listed in this bilateral fund for you to access such funds. If not, there is no need because you are not part of those that are listed in terms of that bilateral fund. And we said uh, for man, funds that are being administered by the uh, uh, Africa Development Bank, it, it's it's there, but it's not it's not good enough in terms of uh, of of volume, the quant, the amount. And we're saying basically, as we are talking about maybe four billion uh, US dollars. And we're saying we need more uh, if we're going to scale up our, our our efforts in 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 climate and carbon markets, and also uh, uh, use leveraging the funding that is existing for us actually to have tangible. Uh, impact on the ground in terms of uh, mitigating uh, climate change through the reduction of <clears throat> of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Hopefully, you enjoyed uh, you will enjoy this um, course. You enjoyed this course since this is the last module. I hope you enjoyed this course. I'm also hoping that you're going to enjoy the quiz, and I'm also hopeful that we are going also to enjoy the overall assessment of this course, which is going to come as part of your week five. So like I said, we have set <coughs> this learning in terms of weeks, week one, module one, week two, module two, week three, module three, week four, module four, week five, module five. But you are not, you are not, you are not forced to follow uh, it like that. Some we know people learn in different ways, but I think if you want to come up with a managing plan, that's how possibly you can do it so that you don't have to let the week pass without doing that particular module. Then you're going to have an overload of trying to do things uh, uh, the wrong way and you won't be able to, to get what you're supposed to be, uh, what we want you to get because we want you to learn more than wanting you to pass. This is about learning and also having hands-on uh, experiences on how to access some of this uh, funding. Thank you so much uh, and I wish you well.